This is Bellamy of Free Radical Radio coming to you from that endless highway that is much less romantic than it is sometimes presented as being. And the following is a conversation with Bob Black. Bob Black is a post-left anarchist thinker, and he is the author of a number of essays and books, including The Abolition of Work, Friendly Fire, Defacing the Currency, and Anarchy After Leftism. Bob just published a book with Little Black Cart called Instead of Work. I'm curious how, as a writer, you've been able to navigate the tension between wanting to encourage the consideration of certain ideas, wanting people to have certain conversations, orienting them toward a certain perspective by putting your ideas out there, having that on the one hand, and then balancing that against what I suspect is an aversion to being ideological, to trying to propagandize in the mass movement way. So I guess what I'm saying is, what does it mean to be involved in media when you have this post-left analysis? Well, ideology is, of course, a loaded word. I mean, when I do it, it's theory. Right. And when you do it, it's ideology. And uh, I don't know, because this word ideology has been, uh, uh, which I believe was invented by Napoleon, that's what I'm like, coined uh, yeah, to, re- to yeah. refer to, I guess, visionary political economists or people like yeah. that in his day. The ideologues. Which, which Marx has took, took up, and ideology is by definition a bad thing because it's by definition more or less false. Uh-huh. I guess it's just a, a sort of system of falsity or a more systematic falsity than your everyday mistake or lie. Uh, as such, we might want to retire that word uh, because I'm not sure it can be saved. And maybe it doesn't have to be. Uh, so naturally, I don't think that I'm ideological in that sense. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, how do you tell? What, mm-hmm. what are the criteria for? Yeah. Besides being, well, um, what I say is true, so it can't be ideology. It must be a theory. Obviously, that's just circular. It's really better not to worry about that. Give me something to talk about. And I call it a theory or an ideology. Uh, and let's just talk about it mm-hmm. uh, for on the merits or the demerits. Uh, maybe after we've worked it through, we can decide whether it's good enough to be a theory or we'll just have to call it an ideology. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of sterile you know, to just you know, um, worry about... Uh, uh, which 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 way to allot certain ways of thinking? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what does it mean for you to be a writer, putting those ideas out there without wanting to sort of gather people under the banner? How do, how do you approach that? Do you think about to what extent do you think about how it's being received, or do you imagine an audience out there? Well, of course, I think about how it's being mm-hmm. received, and sometimes I find out because people tell me. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they tell me very flattering things, sometimes other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I am doing it for my own self-expression and satisfaction, mm-hmm. but I would probably not find too much of that if I thought that absolutely nobody is paying attention to me and nobody ever will. Mm-hmm. I would probably find that discouraging. And then maybe in, in 50 years you'll find my you know, secret diary in the Lavity collection where I commit to it all the, all the my brilliant uh, thoughts that uh, the world wasn't ready for. If they do understand me, then they understand that I'm not rallying them to a banner. Mm-hmm. That, you know, I'm anti-banner. I don't even like the black flag. Yeah. Uh, and that whatever I would like, however I would like them to act on these ideas, and I, certainly I've ruled out uh, what certain of these, you know, certain directions of kinds of kinds of action, such as joining membership organizations or voting. Right. Yeah. You, you uh, don't like the black flag. You know, some people say that the black flag is enough, which I've always found uh, pretty odd. Enough for what? Like, as in uh, this sort of, what I find to be the kind of, lukewarm, cloying, uh, oh, we're all anarchists, we all agree, we should all, or we all have some sort of baseline agreement, we should all support each other. 
kind of thing. I'm well. That's blatantly false. But if there's right. one thing all anarchists supposedly agree on, only I just proved that they don't. Yeah. Well, just pledging allegiance to the same flag is, does not imply any kind of um, agreement. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even imply mutual understanding. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I don't believe that there is a, a sort of um, generic anarchism. Mm-hmm. So a common complaint that I've heard mostly talking to people outside of these ideas, the complaint about post-left or anti-civ analyses is that while the ideas might be interesting and maybe even right, that it's not very actionable, that one doesn't necessarily know what to do with these ideas, either because the problems that they raise are too big, like civilization is a problem, or that they are too vague or that there seems to be almost too much of a demand because one doesn't know how to withdraw from all these institutions or how to fight something so large. What would you say, especially in light of zero work ideas, what uh, might a praxis look like? Well, you realize you, you, you said a mouthful. There. Yeah, I did. I asked very a lot of questions. I think possibly that could be unpacked somewhat. But, sure. But if we want to just narrow it for the moment to Okay, you want the abolition of work, now what? Mm -hmm. Uh, Then it's not not an idea or an aspiration from which you can deduce an action program. Sure. At least I'm I'm sure there isn't one. I can't think of one. Nobody else seems to think so. And and as you say, the critics say, no, there isn't one, and that's what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can always um, compare um, what they deduce from their theories to give them the benefit of the doubt. And see, I mean, I, I like the Hippocratic Oath, which starts it for doctors, which starts out, first, do no harm. I like uh, the uh, other book from my publisher, one of the other ones, uh, Demotivational Training. Mm-hmm which is basically a critique of the idea of of activism for its own sake, Mm -hmm. uh, or activism to prove that you're not uh, a quietist. Uh, I mean, you know, it's... Activism often is sort of based on the old uh, saying, don't just stand there, do something. To which I have always replied, don't just do something, stand there. Look before you leap. Uh, I mean, I would rather uh, be without an action program than to be um, uh, acting on on a wrong one. And uh, even if I thought these excellent ideas cannot be acted on in practice, they would still be excellent ideas, and for that reason alone, they would be better than, uh, than, you know, ideas that aren't even excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the zero work is is difficult, especially under conditions of work as they have developed in the 30 years or more since I started to talk about this. Uh, I write about that a lot in the new final essay in the the latest book. And one of the ironies of, of my original essay was I objected to work, among other reasons, because it's um, it's so confining to a, a narrow area of of human activity uh, that it's saltifying. Mm-hmm. That you know people need uh, you know variety as well as other things like rest, and uh, we can't fully realize ourselves. And I said, for instance, a job. As we now understand that a job is a permanent, lifetime, uh, specialized um, commitment to, pro- to a productive activity. It changes a, in, in, in the ideal model. You may, as you go through what is a career, a career is, is, is a job like over time, mm-hmm. uh, over, over an adult lifetime, theoretically. Uh, you know, you may assume greater responsibility you, you can expect to assume that, you can expect periodic raises in pay and so forth. And I said, you know, I find this 
Uh, well, I'm not even satisfied. I'm not satisfied with that. Uh, but now, the problem is not that people have jobs like that, but that they don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, some writers, Aronowitz and DeFazio, said the only uh, trend in the last, the only kinds of jobs that have increased in the last 40 years are contingent job work, part time, you know, temporary, and all of that. And, uh, you know, that's been true as long as I've been watching. In fact, when I wrote the abolition work, I was a contingent worker. That's usually what I've been when I've done, been a worker. Mm-hmm. It's what I do now when I do anything. And, uh, you know, this, this is, um, you, know, you know, a grave problem. It's the, the, it seems to render almost impossible any kind of collective workplace activity mm-hmm. because no one has a, has a commitment to a certain workplace even if they'd like to like to have one and be, mm-hmm. would be willing to commit uh, that's increasingly not a, simply not even an offer and uh, you know and as they also point out temp work is often by employers promoted as well it's a stepping stone to you know permanent full-time job you know it's a proving ground it's a training ground and uh, and it's just a phase you're going through that is almost total a total lie almost no temp workers ever get permanent Mm full-time employment Uh, and to the extent that they're taken in by this you know they're being had Mm -hmm. but even if they're quite cynically aware of their real situation that probably doesn't mean they can do anything about it so of course I can always be condemned for, you know, arousing you know ambitions that can't be satisfied and causing dissatisfaction where maybe you should just leave people in there. I mean, it, it's a cruel thing to do. I don't agree with that, but maybe that's because there's this, an element of cruelty in my nature. Mm-hmm. But uh, so with it, with a, a change like that, you know that. Anyway, there's the irony, and uh, and there's a big problem, which seems to me to well, I can't imagine an action program to deal with that besides a general strike, mm-hmm. and I'm all for that. Mm-hmm. But uh, general strikes, uh, and, and we've seen some nowadays in some of these anti-communist revolutions. They'll, I haven't seen them called that in the newspapers, but part of that involves a simply a mass withdrawal from work and ordinary activity, temporarily anyway, and that will have to be involved in you know, any positive action. But these things aren't being, um, you know, these strikes aren't being called by unions or political parties. These movements aren't brought into action by by these kinds of parties. Uh, you know, if you want to look at Russia, it's more like the February Revolution than the October Revolution, uh, which is why this, the latter is so much worse. I don't know if that answers that. I don't know how answerable it is. So one theme that keeps um, sometimes unintentionally coming up in the interviews I've been doing recently with anarchists who have been writing for a while, been involved in anarchist thinking for some time, is this claim that our conversations among anarchists are getting worse, the quality is getting worse, it's more in bad faith, there's more of this kind of partisan name-calling of, oh, well, you just think that because you were a such-and-such-ist. Do you see that happening? Do you think the, the kind of um, the creativity, the good faith, the moving thought forward, do you think it's getting worse or do you think that's just a kind it's of... It's getting worse, but first I'd rather say I don't remember any such golden age uh-huh. of, uh, you know, anarchist uh, harmonious agreement to disagree. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's been, you know, this name calling, uh, <clears throat> uh, personal abuse, uh, uh, misrepresentation of other views, some of it ignorant, some of it willful. Mm-hmm. There's always been a considerable amount of that. Is there more now? Uh, quite possibly. I think probably there is. Mm-hmm. 
And I think part at least of the reason for that is that uh, the influence of, uh, of leftism. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I, I think that when Marxism ceased to appear to be any viable alternative uh, to the uh, status quo, uh, many people who should have been Marxists, if they're going to be anything, uh, ended up becoming anarchists in good faith or in bad faith. When I hear about a Spartacist um, organization, which en masse joins um, Love and Rage, mm-hmm. I, uh, I find it difficult to believe in the, the good faith of a mass conversion, mm-hmm. especially from Trotskyists who uh, have had a tactic called deep entrism for a long time, namely stealth um, involvement in other organizations. Yeah. Uh, they're too small to set up front organizations like the communists used to be able to do, so they have to insinuate themselves into existing organizations. That's what, certainly what that looked like. Although I haven't fo- never did follow the history of Love and Rage to its uh, predictable demise, uh, so I don't know if that particular group was especially destructive or or not. But and then we have um, I have to say the publishers who have uh, moved into the situation. Uh, anarchist publishing has always been s- such a limited amount of it and generally mm-hmm. so precarious that. If somebody comes onto the scene as an, an anarchist publisher with some money and some continuity and stability, I'm referring to AK Press and uh, PM Press particularly, uh, they're bound to have an impact. Mm-hmm. And their impact is, as far as I'm concerned, almost totally negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is what people read when they start to read things because this is what's available. It's, yeah, that's the first things I read. It's the most thing, the most yeah. readily available even now, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I think you know projects like uh, Little Black Cart, you know, and some others, uh, you know, are, are, are important and, and, and essential at this point. Uh, because sometimes people get ruined before they get exposed to. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I don't like it that there are impressionable people, usually young, excitable people, maybe punk rock people, who uh, are readily imprinted with the first sexy ideology that uh, that they um, get immersed in. Mm-hmm. However, if they're going to be that way, I wish they'd get immersed in my sexy ideology and not Ramsey Kanan's sexy ideology. If they get immersed in mind, maybe there's some, you know, potential for actually understanding what they think they believe. I'm not so sure about uh, what I, I've called AK Press class struggle social democrats, <laughs> uh, promoters of nationalism, uh, essentialism, etc. You know that. Uh, so there are apparently. Uh, Many, many more people are calling themselves anarchists since the the ultimate low point. It might have been, say, you know, 1970 or, or something like that. People who will identify as anarchists, probably their numbers have increased. Uh, but that's from from a tiny amount to a, to a minuscule amount. Mm-hmm. But uh, the the quality may have may have declined, right. uh, not because it was ever so high to begin with, but because there's a you know, always room at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, so when you say leftist influence, you're talking about things like the kind of call-out culture or the, the vindictive denunciation? and The style, certainly, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, for example, the ubi- ubiquitous use of the um, ironic um, quotation marks. Now, this is an old Marxist classic. It goes all the way back to Marx and Engels writing in the 1840s. It's in the Holy Family and the German ideology. It's in um, all of them. Lenin loved it. For instance, his famous book, Left Wing, air quotes, Communism, an Infantile Disorder, Mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. That's been taken up enthusiastically, which is in the first place a total failure of imagination. If if the only way you can um, identify something as 
self-contradictory, something like that is with punctuation marks. If you're unable to articulate that contradiction, you know, maybe there isn't one and you don't know what you're talking about, or or indeed you don't know what you're not talking about. Uh, Theodore Adorno wrote a... uh, an article about this punctuation mm-hmm. marks, which I have often quoted, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's what. It, so, for instance, I'm always a quote anarchist unquote. Yeah, and I'm being told this by people who advocate um, vanguard parties, uh, a national syndicalist state, yeah. federation, not under that name. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, membership organizations which are both all inclusive and doctrinaire. And these are the people who are um, uh, who are punctuating me mm-hmm. as some sort of dubious uh, dubious in my anarchism. Although I've been at it longer than nearly all of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no, this is uh, yes, and it's 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 a it's a it's a lazy uh, way to deal with um, people you disagree with, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what I see a lot of laziness when I read. Uh, the anarcho-leftist materials, I'm basically uh, struck usually by how kind of a pedestrian and, and uh, stereotype they are. It's, uh, you know, you always know what they're going to say about this, that, or the other thing. Uh, they're, they, they say some of these things so often that they're cliches, uh, which they don't appreciate. But then these, they, they don't ever subject these ideas to any kind of, you know, introspection. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of forum for people with seriously different ideas about anarchism mm-hmm. to, uh, to engage with each other. Uh, I mean, no anarcho-leftist periodical will publish so much as a letter from the editor from me much less review my books or publish, you know, an essay or something. The only place that I see any of that is in the letters column of Anarchy, a Journal, Desire, Arm. They at least throw open the letters almost to an almost limited extent, and they publish people who are, you know, saying all kinds of things, leftist nonsense, uh, sexist nonsense, uh, you know, but better that uh, than this uh, this this wasteland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that you can also see that kind of um, laziness or uh, aversion to critical thinking and a lot of the sloganeering that dominates so much of uh, uh, of anarchist conversation, like these expressions like "justice for so and so," where it's it's not even clear what is meant, and it, it comes across almost as this kind of support our troops where it's so vague that it's difficult to disagree with but it's not clearly articulating anything I'm tempted to say that if it's short enough to fit on a billboard you shouldn't put it there (laughs) so do you think that um, so in conversations with other people that I mentioned before they attribute the internet and internet culture to a lowering of the discourse do you agree with that and do you find that it's affected? I, I find that plausible, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly um, things like uh, chat and, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, email, which make it possible and therefore tempting, you know, to just to produce um, snappy rejoinders mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, sloganeering type put downs and this and that. Uh, you know, I, I hate to sound like a, you know, a, a relic of the uh, of the uh, pre McLuhan esque uh, past, but um, it uh, may make a difference when you actually have to sit down and write something, mm-hmm. and maybe put it in the mail. Uh, there may be an opportunity, um, a, cer- a certain degree of self reflection is forced on you. Yeah, at least a certain degree. Uh, Certainly possible to uh, to override that and write any nonsense you like anyway. But yes, I, th- I think the internet makes has made things too fast mm-hmm. and too easy, mm-hmm. and it makes everybody think uh, that uh, 
well, he's got something to say. All I have to do is put it on Facebook, and maybe a billion people will see it, mm-hmm. or at least a hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel it's affected your writing, or it, I, I was always struck by um, there was some some uh, thing in Nietzsche's correspondence where he was writing to one of his friends about how he had acquired a typewriter, huh. and he felt it was changing. The, the way that he would think about things when he sat down. Do you feel it's af- affected you to go from, um, I don't know if you use uh, computers versus uh, pen and paper, if that changed in your writing? Or... Uh, it changed it. Mm-hmm. Until, uh, I don't remember this for certain, but it's probable that um, the abolition of work was composed on a manual typewriter. Mm-hmm. I know that I was using uh, manual typewriters, uh, then electric typewriters, uh, fine IBM Selectric, uh, a few years later, and uh, but I think it, it's the move to word processing has affected my writing for better or for worse. I mean, uh, for one thing, I write much longer things now, uh, and I used to be that I did not do a lot of um, editing and moving things around because that's a lot of trouble when you type something. Yeah. Like this and that. I tended to have a much clearer idea at the outset of what I wanted to say, sort of an implicit outline maybe. Right. And, uh, and then go back uh, to it later and uh, maybe not make too many changes. Now, you know, you can move things around, uh, you can delete things, uh, and I don't even make the most use of these these capacities. I'm not a good user of uh, Word, for instance, which mm-hmm. is what I type in. And it makes it possible to, it's easier to write longer and longer things. And and in the last few years, I've been writing things with footnotes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not repudiating those things because that is a way to deal with some subjects in a larger way, but... Uh, I also miss the the uh, crisp, concise way that used to be the main way I wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I see some of that. Uh, I still write that way, but you mostly find it interspersed amongst these other, uh, you know, longer. Uh, you might say more traditional and formal. Mm-hmm. If if I ever, if anything I ever wrote uh, could be called somewhat experimental in form. I haven't written anything like that in a long time. Mm-hmm. So, continuing with talking about your writing, I've, I've heard you described by others as a polemicist, and I've heard you described as a troll before trolling was a thing. How do you feel about these characterizations? A polemicist, certainly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, of course, I heard from uh, online, you know, like, scores and trolls before anybody told me what the word meant. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it means something like uh, enjoying the opportunity to you know, insult somebody who's actually smarter than you are, or more famous, or more interested, uh, or just because there's somebody there to, to, uh, to insult. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think... Not much of my writing can be dismissed as pure invective, I don't think. There's mm-hmm. more of that in some than in others. Uh, generally, uh, if I find myself writing in that vein, uh, I will have to reconsider that later mm-hmm. and see how much content there is. I mean, if, if you want to read things I've written about Murray Bookchin and Noam Chomsky, mm-hmm. you will certainly find a lot of things there that, well, you'll cert- they are polemics, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you may find you know, some things that uh, sound trollish, but you also find hundreds of footnotes mm-hmm. and rather detailed discussions of numerous books and essays by the people I'm criticizing. Mm-hmm. As long as that's there, I think, uh, well, you'll just have to take the, the, the trollish stuff, too. Uh, it, uh, it's a package because it's all me. Mm-hmm. Looking at anarchist ideas and actions today, what do you find exciting that's happening, and what do you find 
disgusting or horrifying or disappointing? I have to. I view these things uh, with a lot of detachment because I am not part of any um, local anarchist uh, subculture, if you like. It's seen if you're not so sure. And I don't live in the Bay Area anymore. And when I did, I didn't wasn't really plunged into the anarchist. I knew some of these people, but I, I wasn't involved with wooden shoe books or the uh, bow together bookstore or anybody else's projects. Uh, and, uh, and and that proved to my disadvantage when I was ganged up on by an organization yeah. called Process World, right. uh, which uh, which uh, did have this kind of a presence uh, over there. Uh, so. You know, I, I don't, I'm not in a position to say what the sort of dynamics are. You know, I visit the Bay Area from time to time. I get some impression of what's going on. Uh, you know, I know people who are involved in what can fairly be called the subculture, certainly the little black card people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and I know all of them personally, all mm -hmm. the ones who are not, not the transients necessarily. You know, they're friends of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the people who publish Anarchy magazine, uh, and I know various other people out there. Uh, but it's really hard for me to to assess the whole thing. I mean, I, I, I look, I intervene in that scene, you know, but only by writing. I criticize AK Press, perhaps, uh, no, no, uh, and, and and so forth, but. I uh, think such a situation has its uh, has its problems because uh, you can become self encapsulated. Many years ago, I, I um, ridiculed uh, Freddie Bear, a former friend of mine, who was uh, thoroughly involved in that Bay Area milieu uh, when I lived around there. I said, uh, you know, she uh, can probably tell you a lot of things about the Spanish Revolution, but she probably doesn't know when the Civil War happened. And kind of things like that. Of course, now most people don't know either. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a detachment from... Uh, or or a, a, an undue emphasis on the internal workings of, of the, the subculture and on the on the uh, doctrines and writings of it, uh, you know, there are still people out there who read, um, you know, the most esoteric, uh, exotic, obscure anarchist uh, situationist uh, uh, insurrectionist texts you could imagine, but have nothing that could be considered um, a connection to the general culture. The intellectual culture, their their connection to the to the general culture is uh, through um, television uh, or uh, and uh, Netflix and uh, people who listen to podcasts and uh, so forth. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I it's easy for me to say because I'm not getting my hands dirty in it. Uh, but you know there's a and people who are doing that don't often appreciate how isolating they, they are from, from, from other kinds of people right. I mean it's not just, just the anarchists I mean, leftists certainly are the same way uh, and if you're going to be a, you know, a, in, in an isolated self-referential Social situation. It might as well be an anarchist one, uh, but this, um, for one thing, it's going to uh, interfere with your access to a, a larger public. Uh, I, I honestly have to say that although Anarchy Magazine is the best anarchist magazine I know of in the world, uh, a lot of people who, who would pick up a copy would probably find it uh, mystifying. Yeah. On the other hand, a lot of people who picked up a copy of the Wobbly paper, the industrial worker, it's called, 
Maybe they'll recruit him an industrial worker someday as a member. Uh, they can maybe something like worker emeritus or something like that. But uh, you know that too. You know they're gonna say Wobbly's organized hot dog stand in Valparaiso, Chile. You know, and other like breaking news like that. And um, our platform. Uh, fresh out of 1908. Uh, so uh, we've sto- I've stopped talking about what you asked me about. Started talking about how to bridge the gap mm-hmm. and uh, how to make it make anarchist ideas intelligible and interesting to, pe- to people who are not. I, I'm not just saying not anarchists, of course, but to people who are not political activists or, you know, like leftists or, 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 or right-wingers either, for that matter. I mean, a, I mean, a Tea Party person might well understand uh, those, those newspapers and magazines better than somebody walking down the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe. Uh, and, and that's something that I've dabbled in. Uh, I wrote an ABC of anarchism. Other people have done that. Uh, the, the, there's, the, there's a group online that has something by Anarchy 101, I think they call it, too. Uh, David Graeber just wrote one. Uh, Crime Think does you know, a lot of this sort of stuff. Uh, and I don't, I'm not satisfied with any of it, including my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is why it's just as well that there's a multiplicity of them, mm-hmm. because what may uh, uh, make sense to some uh, lay readers may not make sense to others. And uh, but that's uh, but then what do you do? Hand them out uh, on the street like the Revolutionary Communist Party hands out leaflets or? I leave them in public bathrooms. Or, or uh, <laughs> well, you know, you know what I did for many years. I put up posters. Oh. And where uh, pithiness is at a premium. Oh. And I, I heard about that. What what was that like for you? And what kind of content were you putting on? Well, if you want to see a few of the posters shrunk down, they're at the beginning of Friendly Fire. Oh, okay. The original format. I haven't done that uh, in a long time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I started doing them in Ann Arbor and because I was working for a court which was using legal-sized paper, and I ran some of these off at work. My posters started out being that size, too, which is kind of inconvenient. And I continued to do it that way. And they were you know, texts, short texts, and crude paste-ups, mm-hmm. which, considering... Well, I don't know, a couple of artists said that, you know, you know, for for somebody with absolutely no artistic you know, ability at all, this this is fairly effective. I was sort of like 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 a primitive. I was sort of a grandma Moses of uh, of uh, poster art, mm-hmm. uh, not not slick at all. Mm-hmm. And I put up uh, I don't know over many years, tens of thousands of these posters. Everybody I know and. Probably almost everybody I, I know now, um, uh, in a, in any political context, directly or indirectly knows me from. Yes. I mean, my my two main love lives in my life, they got to me through my posters, yeah. uh, uh-huh. and, and you know that sort of a thing, and that may still you know be effective. Uh, I don't know. If, you know, there are telegraph poles on Telegraph Avenue where even 30 years ago it was it was hard to staple something else on them because they were practically encased in staples. And I've resumed doing that from time to time. Even when I moved to Albany here, yeah. but only after I uh, quit my job at a law school and before I uh, got any other. I resumed, resumed that poster in here too. And I, I heard from people. Nice. Uh, people I knew in Boston came came through that way. Uh, 
And it got me a story in our local uh, uh, alternative arts throwaway in uh, Metro Lab, yeah. and uh, which uh, led somebody to. Uh, well, I went to a restaurant actually. One of the waitresses stepped forward and said, uh, "Are you Bob Black?" <laughs> if somebody asked me that in um, in San Francisco, I'd probably say no. <laughs> As a matter of uh, safety, but uh, yeah, and well, and that was Kerry uh, Goldberg, who uh, was uh, who knew me also because she was a real enthusiast for the zine scene. Yeah. And when Mike Gunderloy moved to our area, publishing his fact sheet five, she was co-editor for a while, uh -huh. and uh, she and her husband have been old friends of mine you know, ever since. Uh, so it's. Uh, the poster has changed my life. Yeah. In at the law school, you were teaching for six months. Yes. Oh, okay. And how did that? The worst job I ever had. Oh, really? Why? Hated uh, students. Grossly under. Well, they hated me, but that's because it was a bad curriculum, which wasn't my fault. No. Uh, uh, insultingly low pay for a professional, although. It's the highest, still the highest pay I've ever received, uh -huh. and that was 35 years ago. Uh, 60, 70 hour weeks. Uh, you know, I, I was teaching legal research and writing, uh -huh. uh, which the way they they treated that was you were not a uh, you were not a tenure track professor. Certainly, in fact, you were not a professor. They gave us some other title, <coughs> and. Uh, you were second class, and your course is second class, too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't graded according to the standard A through E. It had a separate thing which didn't affect the grade point. Now, the smarter students immediately realized that uh, they would be wasting their time putting a lot of effort into research and writing, even though that's the only skill they would learn. Right. The other stuff, they're just memorizing it'll be on the bar exam, and they'll forget it by then. Right. It's obviously in their interest to uh, get high grades in the real courses. Mm -hmm. So they weren't very uh, thrilled with my course. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yes, a couple of them were difficult. And, uh, you know, you know, that, you know, some of the professors, most of them, you know, would not even say hello in the hall. Yeah. Uh, so after uh, six months of that, uh, I, on an impulse, I just said, screw it. You know, I, and I quit the job uh, ten days before the second semester. That would have caused caused them some little trouble. Yeah. And uh, later, I had to sue them in small claims court for the rest of the salary they owed me. Uh -huh. uh, that was a very funny thing. Small claims court usually isn't very formally legal, but in this case, the plaintiff was a lawyer, and the defendant was a law school. Yeah. And the defendant was represented by the dean of the law school. Wow. It was their counsel, and uh, in the only known uh, case known to me, perhaps in human history, the judge in this case wrote a, uh, produced a written opinion on, on it, and the first thing he said that he's never seen like so much hostility in a, in a courtroom encounter. And when you can, when you consider that people in small claims court are often almost in each other's throats, right? Uh, you know that that's. That's that's impressive. Uh, so uh, so we sort of settled that. I got a little more money out of them, but uh, and then I was stuck in Albany, where I've been ever since. Mm. I wasn't a member of the New York bar. I couldn't get a legal job here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of the article. It's something on Lidcom, where uh, it's it's a bit that's one of those places that uh, won't publish me, but will publish things denouncing me. That this is a case about um, it was something about uh, it, it was a long, basically anti primitivist or anti primitivist, anti anti civilization thing, and they bring you up and uh, use the word lawyer basically as a pejorative to mm -hmm. sort of signify this is a bad person or somehow not an anarchist. How has your what's that intersection been like for you being a lawyer and being an anarchist? If I had ever practiced uh, law 
practice it in a strict sense. Uh-huh. In a law firm, for instance, I, I don't know how I could have reconciled that, not in my own mind, but simply in, 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 in my activity. Mm-hmm. Well, for better or for worse, that never happened. Uh-huh. Uh, I've never had a permanent full-time you know, legal job. By the way, now I've resigned from the New York, California bars, so they can't say that anymore. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I can also point to the fact that there have been a, a famous classical anarchists who were lawyers. Uh-huh. Luigi Galliani was about as orthodox a left anarchist as you could possibly imagine. Uh, Lysander Spooner from the 19th century. Yeah, I didn't know he was a lawyer. None of these people who uh, sneer at lawyers uh, ever uh, ever shy away from retaining one when they need one. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as for how it may have affected, uh, I don't know if you were asking about that. I don't what, my thinking? Yeah. yeah. Well, it did in a way because it was during law school that I became an anarchist. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this law is this immense, elaborate you know, construction. And, uh, you, know, you know, when you get into it, there's a, an immense amount of ingenuity and intricacy uh, that even has some intellectual interest, although lawyers usually don't care. But then when you get down to when they occasionally talk about the foundations of what they're doing, uh, you know, there's, there's no basis there, particularly my property class. Mm-hmm. You know, they threw in a little bit at the beginning, uh, mostly from law and economics professors, mm-hmm. uh, about, you know, what is property? What is, what is property, to coin a phrase? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what's it, what's it based on? And, you know, uh, it was really hanging in the air. It's not based on anything that can be taken seriously. So that actually influenced me. And this was at the same time that I was reading all this fresh new stuff like, Black and Red, Freddie Perlman, mm. uh, The Fifth Estate and It's Good Days, uh, and things like that. So, by the time I, by the time I graduated, I was an anarchist. Mm-hmm. However, it didn't seem to work that way for anybody else. So, returning to the earlier question, are there things? I mean, you mentioned Little Black Heart, something you feel positively about. Are there other things happening, whether uh, in the states or internationally? As far as anarchist activity, that are as far as that activity, I know about publication projects. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't seem to know about activity. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I used to hear something about activity from uh, publications like Anarchy when they came out frequently, mm-hmm. and they would have some sort of current news. They can't do that anymore. They come out every six months or every year. Yeah, and the kind of current news you get in the industrial worker, you know, the hot dog stand and all that. You know, who cares? I think some there sometimes there are cases where in some little small business and the workers are getting in trouble with the the boss and they're probably going to get canned. Uh, then they join the IWW. Yeah, <laughs> and at least the. Then they can tell themselves that they're uh, mar- labor martyrs or something, yep. and I uh, get a story in a newspaper. I think that's maybe what happens. I don't know if those people stick around, and but I'd like to know what the turnover is in, in a membership organization like the IWW, or these or these things that keep coming and going, NEFAC, Love and Rage. I would guess extremely high. Mm-hmm. What I hear, the turnover rate at... Uh, AK Press at least used to be extremely high. Burnout rate might be a better name for it. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's pretty funny that the uh, the post left type projects, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, more into the particular, um, uh, the ephemeral, the uh, you know, the the, the, the changing. Uh, they seem to last longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, also supposed to be the kind of. Fucked up, decadent people. <laughs> oh, yes. I think you're, you're groping for the phrase lifestyle anarchist. Yes. Yes. Yes, decadent. Um, petty bourgeois and lumpen at the same time. Yeah, which is... So <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> well, but the Bay Area is a special place, so maybe it happens there. But uh, yes, petty bourgeois, uh, lumpen, uh, uh, individualist and fascist, they're both that, of course. 
and so on and so forth. As you know, I wrote a book about Murray Bookchin's idea there, Anarchy After Leftism, mm -hmm. and uh, consider the expression simply a nonsense phrase. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's Bookchin's like many decades as a Stalinist and Trotskyist, you know, that prepares him for this kind of talk about a polemic. Mm -hmm prepares him for this kind of uh, activity. Um, well, but by my own route, I uh, was prepared for it, too. Mm -hmm. um, Which probably didn't answer your question. It did. In other words, I'm not well informed, I guess. You uh -huh. know, I simply have to say, you know, yeah. you know what, what's ever been going on that interests me? Even that I get, you know, through books. I mean, for instance... Uh, you know, for a few years there was queer ultraviolence, mm -hmm. which, while well, it was going on, I never heard of. Mm -hmm. you know, I only heard about it after it was over from a from a little black card book. Yeah, and that struck me reading the stuff they were writing and doing as uh, kind of a little off from my own emphases, but uh, uh, that was, I thought, a uh, constructive, in other words, uh, destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, series of projects. Mm -hmm. And then we have Occupy, you know, what to make of that. Uh, my personal exposure, I was, I was involved in the Albany Occupy for a, almost throughout its, its, its entire existence, which was, I think, about 10 hours, uh, about the, the lifespan of a mayfly. Uh, Adult mayfly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the only thing I saw about that was the interesting way in which consensus can be um, so highly organized. Mm -hmm. A group of people who uh, either were emissaries of Occupy Wall Street <coughs> or had been trained by them mm -hmm. were, you know, speaking to this audience, which I'm sure all, none of the rest of us, almost none of them, knew, were familiar with these you know, mic check and blocks and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So naturally these practices were being abused, but then people didn't really understand them either. Mm -hmm. You know, I was saying this to somebody later on the bus, uh, and they said, well, yeah, well, it's, you know, it has to be learned. You know, it, it'll, it'll be more um, genuinely consensual and uh, participatory you know, when people learn how to do that. Okay. But there was never an opportunity to find out if that would happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, and uh, so, so again, that's something I only read about. You know, I've read about particularly Wall Street and Oakland, and can't help but find them interesting uh, because of the way they were in so many ways um, anarchist practices in practice, although they avoided theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and demands usually, and I think that's interesting. And I wonder how long it could be, you know, could be sustained. None of them were allowed to be sustained for long. They were all destroyed eventually. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I find that interesting. But you know, I sometimes feel I don't have the right to uh, criticize things that I don't know at first hand, mm -hmm. and I'm not I'm putting myself, you know, in any sense at risk for. But uh, I would like to think, though, that thousands of people went through the various Occupy things, or maybe tens of thousands, probably. And it may be that uh, some of those people who have come away with that, with the, you know, a lasting idea about maybe not anarchist ideas, but um, anarchist ways of... Um, social interaction or, or even maybe decision making. Mm -hmm. So I have to regard that I, I guess it's a pretty positive thing but uh, generally as I look around the, the, the world the landscape I don't see much to be positive about. Which is the perfect segue to the next question which I was going to ask do you do you consider yourself an optimist or a pessimist or do you eschew either term? Well, I'd rather eschew them than obfuscate them. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently wrote someplace something like, uh, I, 
I think of myself as a pessimist, and then I find out I've been an optimist. In other words, things are getting worse even faster than I anticipated. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would probably be a, you know, a terrible optimist if I went in for prophecy a great deal. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I've almost never done that, and therefore avoided making a fool of myself on, uh, I'm sure, many occasions. You know, I never said that there was going to be a revolution against work mm-hmm. or against anything else for the state. Uh, you know, I only said this would be a fine idea. Uh, I'm interested in what I think may be. I look for, for trends that may somehow um, promote that. It isn't easy to find them, though, especially in the world of work right now. Mm-hmm. It's all, I, I can find almost nothing that, that's promising. I mean, the, the, tri- the shift to contingent work just makes uh, workers more helpless mm-hmm. than, than they already were. Uh, probably the best thing to come out of that is that it's hard to believe that the work ethic survives at all anywhere, except maybe in some law firms and executive suites. Uh, I don't think it was ever a very uh, deep or widespread. In fact, I <clears throat> write about that in, in the in the latest book. Uh, but it is true, and I'm old enough to remember this, that there was a time when there was a certain uh, substantial block of the middle class, the working class, who... Maybe they they didn't have a work ethic exact, exactly, but work was central to their lives. They accepted that as a central part of their lives. And because it was so central to their lives, it was part of how they uh, regarded who they were. It was how they saw themselves as contributing to society. It was how they saw themselves as being even part of society. Uh, and so that they had something to lose but their chance, mm-hmm. at least certainly in their own minds. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to believe that there are very, very many people who feel that way now. The, yeah. kind, the kinds of jobs that we have now, the de-skilled jobs, the, service the jobs. short-term jobs, the, the, yeah, the crummy service jobs, uh, which are so demeaning, uh, the only way you could incorporate that into your self of sense is if you have no self-respect at all. <laughs> so I'm assuming people don't usually do that anymore. Uh-huh. So I'm assuming that there is basically zero belief in work as anything except an inevitability. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there's a common phrase now when people say, oh, it's just a job, as if to say, I don't identify with this at all. Yeah. Well, people have been saying that for a while, but it's... Yeah. Uh, it may not even be that, but uh, yeah. So that, so if somehow their circumstances arise or can be um, arranged to arise, where there is some opportunity to reject work, you know, on a fairly large scale, a collective scale, I don't think that uh, too much there. There's very much in the way of ideology or. Uh, or religion or anything that would hold people back from doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people are working out of necessity and force of habit. Uh, you know, they, they they don't find satisfaction in their jobs. Uh, so, in in that sense, um, the the probably there's been a, a greater spread of uh, cynicism, which. Uh, is potentially, you know, a, a powerful force. Although, in the short term, everybody says that cynics are, you know, just resigned to to their fate, and uh, they're just sitting on the sidelines saying how dumb everybody else is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there isn't uh, an anger that might well forth, you know, when there's an opportunity. So something you mentioned earlier was uh, things are getting worse even faster than I expected. Do you have a kind of long frame regressivist look at things? Do you see us as 
getting worse and worse and worse over hundreds or even thousands of years, or do you just mean in the short term? Well, this can't go on for thousands of years. No, I'm I don't saying, think it can you go on for hundreds of years. When you look back, mm-hmm. I'm saying, do you see a, a gradual decline in the, the quality of living? Something we talk, I should give you some background. Something we talk about on the show is um, a theme that comes up is whether domination, exploitation, alienation, are they getting worse as time goes on, or are they just becoming qualitatively different? And when you said things are getting worse even faster than I expected, I was wondering whether you, looking back, see 200 years ago it wasn't as bad, 100 years ago it was getting closer, now it's worse. Well, uh, work has been de-skilled ever since sure. the Industrial Revolution and sure. very, at a very rapid rate in the last 30 or 40 years. If, if that's qualitative, then that's a qualitative change for the worse. Uh, working hours in this country anyway have been rising for well since 1940 mm-hmm. uh, quantitative. I guess you could say that's quantitative I don't think calling them the one or the other it really makes any difference though. Mm-hmm. and uh, at least at the in the short run it looks like those will both continue mm-hmm. wages are, are, are you know, real wages I think are still declining mm-hmm. uh, in the short term, I'm sure all those things will happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I see a, a kind of biological, natural limit to, you know, you have to feed people a certain amount. Uh, you know, you have to let them sleep sometimes, and you should allow them some uh, some uh, some time to uh, forget their troubles and amuse them. Mm-hmm. And uh, those those limits may be uh, close, uh, and I don't know what will happen when they're reached. You know, will the will the bosses pull back? Will the workers, in some sense, revolt, or what will happen? I don't know. Mm-hmm. So there's a a sort of catastrophist tone to some of what you're saying. You seem to be pointing at some kind of endpoint. When you say, I don't think it can go on for hundreds of years, you see... Well, nothing ever did go on for hundreds of years, after all, so... Mm -hmm. And things happen faster now. Mm -hmm. Well, those, you know, just speaking of the work thing, you know, whether um, some other trick... Apparently, um, uh, belief in God is slowly declining, Uh, uh, there are some, you know, other changes. Obviously, we see some changes in a in the direction of tolerance with things like same-sex marriage, which mm-hmm. apparently, you know, all young, practically all younger people take it for granted. You know, there, it's no big deal at all, uh, and there's no reason to think they'll ever change their mind about that. Especially since, as the years go on, it will become totally. Uh, Something in everyday life. Everybody yes. sees it. Every, you'll be meeting, you'll be meeting married people like that all the time, working yeah. with them. They'll be next door, you know. So you know, I have to regard that as you know, a, you know, favorable. Although obviously, same-sex marriage is a reform and a, and a rather ironic one, considering that the institution of marriage uh, has uh, traditionally uh, received a considerable amount of anarchist critique, right. which it has. Which it continues to merit. Yeah. In a way, something like this kind of stalls that critique. I remember when I see this. Totally I remember when gay liberation got started, and uh, as far as I know, uh, nobody was interested in same-sex marriage. Yeah. Uh, either they were like not interested in the issue, issue of marriage at all; it wasn't an issue. Or if they were radicals, and there were gay radicals back then. I don't know if they still exist, except a few of these hostile people would call themselves queers. Right. But uh, you know the the you know the Starbucks gay mainstream. Yeah. Uh, no, I see the marriage thing as completely recuperative and harmful. They uh, the only thing to be said about something like that is about something any civil rights thing is. Well, let's get it over with. Let's get this distraction. 
In 10 years, they won't be able to use this to keep people preoccupied. It'll have to be something else. Right. You know, eventually they'll run out of things like this. And, uh, you, know, you know, so maybe you can, if you're feeling in an optimistic mood, you can regard it as something that's, that's been cleared away. And, and in this specific example, the whole thing was resolved in a, in a matter of a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might have lingered for decades. Yeah. And then everybody would be going around saying, oh, don't tell me about capitalism and this and that when we still don't even have same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's pretty much off the table now. Yeah, that's true. Are there any other topics you want to discuss? Well, only to remind people to buy my book. What, what is your book? Uh, so a lot of it is older pieces. Do you well, as it turns out, um, almost half of it is... The, yeah, the idea, I don't remember if I came up with it or the publisher did, was to uh, uh, make a short book out of everything I've uh, written that's more or less directly about work. Uh-huh. Uh, going back to the abolition of work in 1985 to... A recent response to a to a leftist: What work uh, means, why it matters, which is David H. Also, the, yeah, this is, which is this year. So that's thirty years of this, but it's only eight essays, and in the book they occupy 149 pages, uh, showing that I'm at least not obsessed with the subject, uh, <laughs> but also that I've never lost interest in it. And, yeah. uh, and so then I, I I wrote just for this book uh, a kind of. A, well, it's called Reflections on the Abolition of Work, which you have to buy the book to read that one, and uh, which turned out to be almost as long as all the rest of it. Okay. Um, I just found a lot of uh, topics that were in the uh, in some of the original essays that I wanted to develop further. Um, wanted to discuss this, you know, the precariat, precariat, and mm-hmm. you know, a few things like that. What looks like the continuing free fall of the work ethic, mm-hmm. and uh, so it ended up being pretty long. Uh, but I am happy to announce, though, that uh, having reflected on my earlier writings and done a lot of reading and rereading, that I uh, concluded that uh, I was right the first time, <laughs> almost all the way down the line. Uh-huh. But uh, it's interesting to read why, though. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the composition of the book. Mm-hmm. And I would add that it has a most interesting introduction by Bruce Sterling, the science fiction writer, who reports, uh, to my embarrassment, how reading the abolition work changed his life, mm-hmm. made him quit his day job, and become a full-time writer, and uh, this and that. And, uh, I, I met him. I know him. Uh, that we once did an anti-work panel at a sort of a science fiction convention called Phenomica. But I've been out of touch with him for a long time. He lives in Belgrade now. <laughs> Fortunately, I managed to find him, and we managed to prevail on him, too. And that may trick the science fiction fans into reading it. We made a point of putting his name on the cover. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Um, and so what's interesting to you now? What do you... Are you writing anything now? Do you have... Uh, well, what I'm, what I'm going back to now is I'm uh, taking a pretty long trip to the Philippines next month. Huh? And uh, there are quite a few people there who are familiar with, uh, with my writing and so forth. And uh, apparently I'll have more speaking opportunities than I, than I want. Oh, wow. Uh, at least two, um, probably more. Uh, and uh, one of the things I'm doing is, well, I'll bring as many of the books I can and, and, and hand them out, but when you have to pack for a long trip, I mean, that doesn't leave a lot of space in your, in your suitcase. But uh, I'm arranging to have uh, a couple of things reprinted. Uh, at least partly at my expense, such as the essay debunking 
democracy. Mm-hmm. Somebody has already reprinted a couple of things, as sort of pamphlets. Uh, so I hope that you know those will will, will be spread around. It's the the expense of exporting a real book you know, from from there to uh, the Philippines. Uh, the publisher tells me that they're not they don't remember ever having sent any books to the Philippines. Uh, so I'd like to encourage a local cottage industry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually working up two things I've already given speeches on. One was uh, the subject of human rights. <clears throat> the other was anarchist disputing, which I've given talks on in the Bay Area and uh, want to do better this time. As in disputing conflict? Uh how conflicts are resolved in uh, anarchist societies as opposed to modern societies uh, where anarchist societies are primitive societies. I did this at the Bastard Conference a few years ago. And afterwards, someone came up to me and said, like, uh, hey, I didn't know Bob Black was like that. I was so reasonable. He was expecting fire breathing. Yeah. And stand up t- telling him about anthropologists. And, you know, yeah. uh, well, when after I've turned them into speeches and I come back, I want to turn them into articles. Mm-hmm. So that will probably, all of this will keep me busy for the foreseeable future.